you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Hello, hello. All right. My guest today is Alyssa McCormick, single mom to two boys ages five and two. Alyssa is from the Chicago suburbs and graduated cum laude from Illinois State University with a bachelor's degree in early childhood education and an early childhood special education endorsement. In 2015, she graduated from the College of William and Mary with a master's degree in reading certified K through 12. Alyssa taught preschool and second grade inclusion in gifted classrooms for five years before becoming a stay-at-home mom for the last four years. With some major life changes that Alyssa will share with us on the show, she is now a working-from-home mom, a content creator, and small business owner, where she shares educational content and gentle parenting tips via her platform, Heart-Minded Mama. We get into so much. I love this conversation so much. We start by discussing Alyssa's expertise, which centers around gentle parenting, consent, and body autonomy with our kids. Then we shift gears and we get a really vulnerable account of Alyssa's story. I ask her what brought her to therapy, and she basically starts with her childhood to postpartum depression to an adult ADHD diagnosis, and then her transition into single motherhood. I appreciate her so much for sharing so much of her story, even a thing or two that she says she's never shared with anyone before. All right, so, uh, oh, and that being said, I would like to offer a trigger warning for suicidal thoughts. So here she is. See you on the other side. Hey, Alyssa. So nice to meet you. Thank you for being here with me. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so glad to meet you. I am too. I, you know, I've said this before and I'm having the same moment with you where, you know, I see your face (laughs) all the time (laughs) and now here it is in the flesh sort of, right? Right. You feel like, like, I feel like we know each other because I see you on my feed, but um, I don't really know you. So it's really great to get to do this. I know. It is cool. I appreciate it. And, you know, that being said, I, I... I did find you on TikTok. That's how we're sitting here. Yeah. I followed your account now for a little while. Um, you know, talk to me about how that started. Did you just on a whim say, you know what, let me just put my knowledge to use? <laughs> like, how did you start that platform? Yeah. So um, before COVID hit, I had, it was Musical.ly, right? TikTok was Musical.ly. Oh, I don't even know. It. Yeah. It was called Musical.ly and yeah. all the high school kids were on it. And I had a couple girlfriends say to me, have you ever been on Musical.ly? Like, I feel like you would really like it. There's funny videos. This was back where it was less educational, right? It was more just like kids on the app. And I'm like, no, I don't have time for that. I'm a mom. Like, what? Right. They go, I think you'd really like it. You should just download it. So I did. And then I was like, wow, this is funny. I am enjoying learning what the kids are doing and (laughs) whatever, because I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a 30-something mom, stay-at-home mom. And living in Alaska, mind, mind you, so very isolated wow. at the yeah. time. Um, and so I downloaded it, and then it changed to TikTok. And during COVID quarantine, I was just bored out of my mind. My then husband was in the military, so he had to work. He still had to go to work every day. Mm-hmm. So I was at home with the kiddos, just bored and isolated in Alaska. And we couldn't go anywhere or do anything. So I thought, well, I'll just start making videos. Like, why not? I have all this time. And 
maybe I would help out other moms with giving them some tips and tricks because gosh, I wish I had TikTok when I was a new mom. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that kind of stuff. I became a mom almost six years ago and there was Instagram, but even then it wasn't really curated for, you know, parenting at that point. Right. Um, so anyway, I just started posting some helpful videos and mostly funny videos and just trying to find some mom friends because I was so lonely up there by myself as a, a military wife. And people just started liking my videos and being like, hey, wait, what do you mean by that? Can you explain? I'm like, oh, okay, you guys care about what I say and what I think? Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, yeah. And so I'm explaining more and then they're like, do you, are you like a teacher? Like, do you have a background in this? I'm like, oh, well, kind of, yeah. Like, I'm a <laughs> childhood teacher and I have my master's degree. And I'm like, oh, I guess I should probably say that. Um, and so then I started realizing, wow, I can actually teach parents and like other teachers from home while I'm with my babies, even though I'm not in the classroom. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of took off from there and I just started sharing what I was doing and um, really connecting with other parents and teachers and a lot of younger kids follow me actually more really? than half of my followers are not even parents. Wow. Which I thought was so interesting, but yeah, a very, a very large amount of non-parents that have said to me, Hey, I really like what you're doing. I think what, how you parent makes sense. And I want to parent like that someday. So I'm following you. Mm. I'm, okay. No pressure. Cool. Glad yeah. you're here. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting. So that's kind of how it got started. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess just, kind of an accident, but yeah. a good accident. And yeah. I'm happy to do it. And um, it's become something really great now. Mm -hmm. I actually just made a company out of it. I'm an official LLC now, um, Heart Minded Education LLC. And I'm not really sure where all I'm going to go with it. I would love <laughs> to start doing like, um, you know, courses with parents and, and with teachers and just really making it into something really awesome. So mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about Heart Minded. Where does that name come from? So I was Once Upon a Mama, yes. right? And that's what most people um, know me as. That's what I started as. And that was just a random name I came up with. But the YouTube is taken by someone. Oh. And it's a very common phrase. Mm -hmm. So I quickly realized that if I wanted to like continue doing this, I probably had to change my name because mm -hmm. it was just taken everywhere. Um, so then I did months of thinking and research and soul searching, honestly, to figure out who am I, like, what do I want to represent? What phrase or name embodies who I am as a parent, a teacher, a person. Mm -hmm. And I actually came up with it with my manager because I was talking with her, she's one of my best friends and we're talking and she's like, okay, well, like, let's think of some ideas. And we know I'm really big into emotional intelligence and gentle parenting and intuition and empathy. And so we, we came up with heart minded, meaning like thinking with your heart, but not just on a whim going with your intuition and what feels best, but also the minded part of using research based practices, right? Like we're, we need to actually look at research and see what it says. And that's the teacher part of me. Mm -hmm. Um, but the heart part of love and gentle, I just yeah. don't, I don't like that term of gentle parenting. It gives off such a bad message I think of like permissive yes parenting yes. so I'm saying heart mind and it's getting parent. oversaturated oh totally. totally I mean everyone's kind of taking their own spin on gentle parenting and it's become very confusing I'll be very, honest with you very confusing and yeah. people mix it with because gentle you think oh right, right it's okay right. so then you think permissive and right. I don't like that so I was like I I don't even like saying gentle parenting and I know it is rooted in authoritative parenting, right? But that sounds like authoritarian. Right. So it's all bad. I was like, these are all bad names. I don't yeah. like these. I want to make my own. So we came up with heart-minded parenting. And I yeah. feel like that perfectly embodies the whole system of mm -hmm. thinking with your heart and your brain. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want kids to, right, like just do whatever they want all the time and not have any guidance and discipline. Right. But you want to do it with kindness and empathy and love. And so that's where I came up with heart-minded is like the mix of both. Yeah, so now I'm the heart-minded mama. I love it. I love it. And it, it <laughs> makes a you. lot of sense. And um, I want to ask you a bit more about it, but I do want to go back and clarify. Yes. Your manager, this uh -huh. is not like a talent manager. You actually no. still work full time. And so you're referencing yeah. a em employer sort of like a, your manager at your employer at work. <laughs> like, no, I'm, I'm referencing like well, one of my best friends who is helping me build up my company and my brand. And she's like, 
like helping me do all of this and work oh, through so this. And oh, okay. on top of me working all my other okay. jobs as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so, so what, what, what do you, what are you doing? How many, how many jobs do you have? <laughs> I know. I'm a mess. Okay. So I'm working, I work part-time for a real estate brokerage doing customer service. I work part-time for another company doing social media. So that's okay. my two full times into one, but I can do both remotely from home. Yeah, that's great. And that's kind of my key right now because I have a five-year-old who's in kindergarten full day, mm -hmm. but I have a two-year-old. Yeah. And I know if I go back to teaching, yeah. that is such, I'm an elementary teacher, such a demanding job in all areas. Mm -hmm. And half my salary would go to daycare. Yeah. And during a pandemic, which right. my oldest son and I are both high risk. So we're trying to stay home as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do all of the things mm -hmm. so that I can be home with my son, my two year old, yeah. and then be there for my five year old if he needs me. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing those two jobs at the same time. I am now doing this. Okay. okay. So I guess I have like three jobs. Yeah. Um, so my, I call my friend who's helping me. I call her like my manager, but okay. she's just helping me out of the kindness of her heart. And she's helping me navigate all this because she's more in the business world. Um, teaching is not like the business world. Yeah. Right. Like I don't have that experience. So she's helping me navigate all of this. And um, we came up with that term together of, okay. of heart minded. And so it's, it's really going great. Yeah. yeah. I have well, a lot of jobs. You have a lot on the plate. <laughs> I um, do. Yeah. And so your, your platform, I mean, I initially came across, I don't know if this was initially your focus or just happened to be the videos that I was first coming across, but they were all uh, uh, centered around consent Mm -hmm. Um, and, and those videos get you thinking they, they I, I mean, and I'm going to ask you to talk about it, but I'll just mention a few that p sparked conversation in my house where, you know, having to do with tickling, secret keeping, yeah. um, adult contact, even if it's family, close friends, um, tell, tell me your stance on this and, and kind of what you practice and model for your kids and, and everyone you're trying to help. Yeah, for sure. So the consent videos and the um, tickling and the body autonomy, that's really what I think got me to go viral. Yeah. And that's what people first noticed. And what's funny about it is I had so many people at the time comment and be like, wait, hold on a second. You're onto something here. This makes sense. Mm -hmm. Why are we not learning this? Why are we not teaching this? Why are we still doing this to kids? And I'm like, hey, hold on a second, guys. We learned all this in our early childhood education class classes. I learned all that in undergrad teaching. I'm like, you guys don't didn't learn this. Why are all people not learning these things? Mm. Why are only teachers learning it? Teachers should obviously they work with yes. kids, but shouldn't everybody else? Yeah, right. <laughs> like hold on. Right. So then I'm like, oh, I'm onto something here. I can really help people here mm -hmm. because I, I guess just naively didn't realize that not everybody is learning this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so then I wanted to share because I'm, I, of course my red flags go up and I'm like, yo, all of these kids are still being forced to do this and this and this and this, like mm -hmm. we need to help. Mm -hmm. So, um, just from day one, I started teaching my sons that, you know, they don't have to hug people if they don't want to, but that was a polite thing when we were growing up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You leave a family gathering go give grandma a hug, yeah. go give uncle a hug. And there were some family members that you probably didn't want to touch. Yeah. And, you know, or maybe you didn't know them that well. So you're like, wait, why do I have to hug them? But if you didn't, you'd get in trouble because you were being rude. Yes. Well, why? Yeah. <laughs> that, that messes up children's body autonomy. Like they need to feel in charge of their bodies and know that they can decide who touches them and who they touch. Um, so I've told my sons from the beginning, you don't have to hug. And give a high five, right? Like I don't want to. I don't want them to be rude, right? But they don't have to hug. So you can wave, you can say goodbye, you can do a high five, fist bump, or you can hug if you want to. My two sons are actually not big huggers. They only want to hug me and their dad, and that's really it. Mm -hmm. And so they'll just say goodbye and walk out, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I actually am a big hugger, <laughs> so it was a big wake up call for me to hear from other people that they didn't like to hug because I actually didn't mind hugging everybody all the time. And I have to catch myself now when I see people, I'm like, Hey, how are you? And mm. I go to hug them and I'm like, Oh, you might not want to hug me because I was <laughs> that other person right. um, all the time. So my sons know that they don't have to hug or touch people. Um, and then with, with their own bodies from day one, their dad and I always wanted them within reason, 
right, to feel as in control of their body as they could. Mm-hmm. So even when we're dressing and undressing them, you know, when they're babies, they don't understand. You have to take care of them and, you right. know, do all of the things. But as they got older, like one, two, three years old, it's I need to be talking to them while I'm undressing and dressing them, telling them what I'm doing. Um, in our classes in school, they would say, if you're taking off a child's pants to change them, why are you not talking to them about it? They just feel like a rag doll, like being manipulated. And that sets them up down the line to feel like they don't have full control over their body. Um, of course you need to take care of them, but you should include them in the conversation. So they would tell us, sing to the child, talk to the child, tell them what you're doing as you're doing it. And so we've been doing that with our kids Mm -hmm. from day one. And, um, I've had a lot of, I had com I had comments, right? I would get good comments and bad comments. I bet. Yeah. And the biggest comment we would, I would get about that would be like, babies can't give consent for changing a diaper. Just change the diaper. Jeez. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, hold on a second. Of course I'm changing the diaper. But the point is that I'm talking to the child so that they're not just like zoned out while I'm manipulating their body and trying to clean them. I'm talking to them. So I'll say like, okay, I'm taking your diaper off now and we'll sing and we'll talk. I'm like, okay, I'm going to wipe right here. Okay. I'm going to wipe your bottom. And it's using the real words the whole time, Mm -hmm. telling them what you're doing as you do it and just making them feel included in the process. And that really sets that stage for future conversations on body boundaries and autonomy and even consent. And, um, it's, it seems that the world is becoming more understanding of that. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started talking about this years ago, people thought it was a little out of the box um, if they hadn't heard of it before, but I think it's getting to be more normal yeah. now. Um, and, I, and just any time in the day that I can give my kids an option in something in their body, that's great. So, mm-hmm. hey, you know, hey what, which pants do you want to wear today? Like it's 10 degrees out. You have to wear pants. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a safety thing. It is cold, but you can wear these pants or these pants. Which one do you want? Just any little bit that I can to give them some power over their body is, is really important. And so, so help me and anyone listening understand the, the possible repercussions of not doing that. So in not doing that in not doing those small, simple things, yeah. Children grow up to feel like their body doesn't belong to them as much and that they should just let people do things to their body to make them happy or because they said that they wanted to or that this needed to be done. Mm-hmm. So um, and so it just really sets the stage like accidentally for down the line. If somebody wants to touch me somewhere and I don't want to, I might just be like, well, OK, because mm-hmm. you want you want to, but I don't want to. Mm-hmm. But mommy used to do this and I had to just be quiet about it and let her do it. So I guess I should just let you do it. Mm -hmm. And I know it's, that's very deep to think of it that way, but it really does start young like that. Um, and it's the same thing with hugs of uncles and cousins and people that you don't want to touch. I mean, it really starts young that you need to, kids need to feel like their body is theirs Mm -hmm. and it's powerful. And the other side to that is also that other people's bodies belong to them, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's not just that people are, might want to touch you, touch you, but also you do not touch other people yes, unless yes. they consent to that. Mm-hmm. And so we, we talk about that too. Mm-hmm. And I'll see my sons like go to, you know, hug or touch or whatever. And it just touching for fun, you know, we're not going to every time we touch say you need to, you need to ask first because I mean, you need to have those, you know, indirect touches all the time and whatnot, but we do practice. So if brother wants a hug and other brother doesn't, I'll Mm -hmm. say, Hey, look at his body language. Does he look like he wants to hug you or his arms out? Mm -hmm. And my other son will say, Oh no, he's (laughs) turning away and walking away. Well, then that means that he doesn't want a hug. So I'm trying to teach them that body language too and how we can read body language to see if someone wants to touch us or not. But you don't get to just walk up to whoever you want and hug them. Everyone has a personal bubble and personal space. And so we talk about that as well, which I keep meaning to make videos on that. So I need to do that (laughs) too. That reminds me, it's on my list. Um, But that's an important part as well, right, is teaching kids that they can't just touch anybody. And that you can't, everyone has free will. So we can't prevent all bad things from happening, right. but we can try. 
Yeah. We can try with those young kids and really try to teach them right from wrong and how to respect their body, how to respect others' bodies. And I mean, that's just the best way to reach to them is just mm -hmm. to start really young. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do with my boys and, um, and then with other parents so that they can teach their kids as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just want to um, go back to a point you made about, mm -hmm. you know, it not being every time, you know, because I think, and I, and I don't, and I don't say that to just now let everybody off the hook. It's more yeah. just like you said, it's, it's a practice mm -hmm. rather than a mandate. Yes. You know, and, I, it, and it's yeah. getting that language in their brains and it's getting them familiar with concepts mm -hmm. and not saying that if you don't ask for consent every single time you want to touch your kid or your kid wants to touch you, that you're setting your, you and your kid up for failure. Right. It's that we're just starting to get the, their wheel spinning on these yes. ideas and these concepts. Yes. Thank you. That is such an important point to make. I had people mm -hmm. commenting on videos and going, you're a crazy lady. You ask your kids if you can hug them every time. Yes. No, that would okay. be so damaging. Yeah. Like children need that affection from their parents. They need you to come up and give them hugs and love them and, and touch them, especially when they're young, right? When they get into middle school, high school, they might not want to be touched by their parents as much, right. but they need that. They need that spontaneous love and affection. And it's so yeah. important. We know that, mm -hmm. but it's about practice. So I give my kids opportunities to practice Okay. out yeah. of, let's say out of 10 times that I hug them, I might only ask for consent once mm. to practice it. But right. I know my kids too. I right. know which son will hug me 10 out of 10 times and which son might say two out of the 10 times, mm, maybe later mom or mm -hmm. no thanks. High five. <laughs> so it's just about catering to your yeah. children and giving them those opportunities to practice. Yeah, that makes sense. My, my daughter is like, you know, she's the one that's hit or miss. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And whereas my son, he pretty much, if he could get back in my body, he Aww. would, you know? So it, it's true. Yeah. Like he, he will, he'll just sit on me. Whereas she, yeah. if I'm cu cuddling her for too long, she pushes me off. She just yeah. doesn't want it, you know? But, I, but yeah, I think, you know, because like I said, your, your account definitely prompted a lot of conversations in my house and, you know, my husband had that initial feeling of like, you're, you're telling me I need to ask my three-year-old every time I want to hug her. And I was like, yeah. well, I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, just asking you, you to think start. about it. Yeah. yeah. And, and we had the conversation around tickling. Um, mm -hmm. That was a big one, you know, because yeah. tickling in itself, it's a funny thing, tickling, actually, when you think about it, um, because in almost every situation I've been in, whether I was a kid or an adult where I'm being tickled, mm -hmm. you know, you it's like almost, it? well, right. No, not really, but right. it's like, it's <laughs> almost like the more someone dislikes it, the more the person doing it wants to keep going. Uh -huh. And so, and my, like my husband's very playful and he's like a big kid. And, and we were talking about this and it, he really resonated with, Yes, I'm her dad. Yes, like you said, I know my kid and I know when enough is enough. And like, if, but now, truly, like when they say stop, like we both stop because when I said to him, you know, I was watching Alyssa's videos. And the thing <laughs> is, is that you want her to understand, mostly my daughter, right? Because my son was right. still a baby when we had this conversation, but wanting her to understand that if someone who is tickling her, that's, she's not comfortable with or who shouldn't be if she says stop and they don't she needs to understand that's a problem and she needs to understand that she needs to tell us that right. but like you said if she's used to her saying stop and daddy never stops well I guess this random person who's tickling me why should they stop I mean right. it's pretty it's it's pretty deep <laughs> it's very deep it's yeah. very deep I know I know yeah. and the funny thing about tickling too is the laughing that happens is a defense mechanism. You're trying, it's like ingrained in us. It's just like instinct. You laugh to show submission mm -hmm. to the tickler to get them to stop. Yeah. So the more you pay tickling, the more you're going to laugh. Mm. But then the tickler thinks that you like it. So they do it more. Yeah. So yeah. it's like this vicious cycle. Oh. And I mean, yeah. I have literal 
traumatic memories of being tickled by people I won't name and hating it so much that I actually remember being left with the feeling of I don't feel in control of my body like Mm -hmm. I feel violated Mm -hmm. too as a child Mm -hmm. so why are we doing why are we still doing that I don't understand why we're still doing that. So then I was like, we need to change the, the whole conversation and nuance behind tickling and really have people understand like, hey, if you want to tickle for a little bit, cool. But if kids say no or stop, you need to stop right away. Let them know that their voice matters, that they do have a boundary. Um, it's really, really, really important. And I think people are starting to recognize that. Yeah, yeah. Certain I, I think change. So too. I mean, but some kids do like yeah. to be tickled. Right. Some do. Right. Just read the kid. Like you said, you know your child. Yeah. When enough is enough, stop. Yeah. Um, maybe don't tickle other people's children. Right. Um, <laughs> right. I know. We're, like, nobody can see like, us, but we're both, like, wincing. Like, ugh. That, like, no. <laughs> well, like, when, I don't know. In the 90s, when I was yeah. a kid, like, pe- family members would tickle you. Yeah. And I hated it. And it yeah. was like, why are you touching me? So yeah. um, maybe just, like, don't tickle yeah. other people's kids, too. That's a thing. But, yeah. All right, and it, and it's leading me into, you know, talk to me about the idea of secrets versus surprises. Okay, so do you know Janine Sanders? I know she's that. like yeah, she's like one of my favorite authors that talks yes. about all yes. her books are amazing. I actually showcase her books. I have one on... up here, I think. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So I use her books to teach my kids this, and and most other when I'm making the videos, it's her books that have really led this conversation for me. Um, so when we were growing up and we just know from talking to, um, child predators and people of that nature that they would ask children after something would happen or leading up to something that this was a secret between you and me mm-hmm. and we don't want to tell mommy or daddy. So don't tell anybody. It's just a secret between us. So, we want to tell, flip that now and tell kids that, hey, no safe adult will ever ask you to keep a secret. I would never ask a child to keep any bit of information mm-hmm. between me and them, right? Unless it was a surprise, like a surprise party for their mom mm-hmm. or a surprise gift for Christmas. Mm-hmm. So Janine says that you should teach your children that the only type of secret that is ever okay to keep is a surprise and a surprise is a secret that has an end date. Mm -hmm. So there's a time, Hey, tomorrow after school, we're going to go get ice cream. Okay. But don't tell your brother or we're going to get mommy this, I don't know, purse for Christmas. It's a surprise though. So don't tell her, but Christmas is the end date, right? Tomorrow after school is the end date. So if there isn't an end date and it's not a surprise, it's not safe. So we tell kids that if an adult or anybody asks you to keep a secret, and it's not a surprise. You have to tell them, I don't keep secrets. And you go tell a trusted adult right away. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just a safe way, a safer way to try to help kids navigate this. Yeah. And I've also had the com- people have asked me, well, what about like when they're a teenager and they want to keep who they have a crush on a secret? Like what about secrets with their friends? Well, that's privacy. That's different. They can have privacy. Children need privacy, especially in middle school and high school, right? Like that's a whole thing. <laughs> Um, they need privacy, but privacy is different from secrets. Secrets usually hurt somebody or they keep someone from getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. You can have privacy of who you have a crush on. Right. Um, and nobody's getting hurt when you have privacy. So that's kind of the difference there. And my son will even tell me, he said that his teacher said, um, to keep a secret about pajama day happening. He goes, mom. She told me to keep a secret, and we don't keep secrets. Oh and I was like, goodness. you're so right, baby. <laughs> I was like, Aww. but also, it's kind of like a surprise, right? Because the end date was that pajama day was going to be on this day. So, like, it's kind of, you know, there's an end date. He's like, yeah. okay, yeah, he's five. So, we're yeah. navigating, but we've had those conversations. Yeah. So, it's going to take practice to get yeah. there, but he's already learning it at five years yeah. old. So, that's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's a great example because, you know, similar to – to the point we made earlier, it's, it's a practice. And I think what I'm getting is, is just by having conversations with your kids, conversations that you, you think might be over their heads Mm -hmm. or they don't need right now, 
or there's been no reason to think they do, just by having them, you're putting ideas in their head that are going to come out later. And it's going to make, I think, like you said, the conversations down the line easier to have. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's definitely, it's a, it's, it's definitely heavy stuff. It is. It is because you know what? It's, this is going to sound so ridiculous, but like parenting is hard. (laughs) It's the hardest like, oh, thing just, across there's so all. much. There's so much we yeah. need to do for them. <laughs> Especially because we weren't raised in today's world, first of all. I know. Totally different world. I know. Um, and we just weren't raised like this. Yeah. I don't know about you, but like we were mostly raised in authoritarian households of you follow the rules, you listen. There's no gentle parenting. Compliance. Um, yeah. yeah, all about compliance. And yeah. so it's it's a different world. And I think parenting is a lot harder now because we are doing it the right way now. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. takes work. Yeah. I know. It's hard. <laughs> and maybe just because you and I are talking at night, it's like, I'm just tired. I don't want to <laughs> have to do it, but I, I have to bad. do it. Yes. Yeah, like, know. it's just so intense. Know. You know, I don't, it's just, it's. So a little bit at a time, you, yeah. you're not going to solve yeah. all the problems in one day. And so that's why I say just like practice little bits every day and eventually mm-hmm. it becomes their life yeah. and they're all knowing and everything they know and everything they're going to practice. Like my son with the secrets, like I think we've had a couple conversations about it, but he's five and he's mostly with me all day, every day, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a single mom. Like he doesn't really go anywhere else. And so we haven't hit it that hard like not super super duper hard yet he's not having sleepovers anywhere nothing like that and yet he came up to me and told me that yeah and I thought wow well you got it I guess yeah great it's amazing (laughs) and and you know speaking of just sort of this being a different world and I think there are a lot of obvious implications of that social media technology Mm -hmm. pandemic all of that and you talked about you know sleepovers like I'm seeing a lot of that sort of uh, talk now on TikTok mostly about like um, a community, I guess, of content creators who are saying my kid won't do sleepovers ever. Mm-hmm. Like, where do you sit with that? Uh, so I think I was one of the content creators who started that conversation on yeah. TikTok, actually. And I, I said on there, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. My Why? children will not have sleepovers unless like, I have to, you know, like if I, when like they go visit their dad, right. but it's their dad, that's different. But their dad has a partner mm-hmm. who's a stranger to me. Mm-hmm. I have no control over that. Mm-hmm. So that's an instance of a sleepover that I cannot, I have no control over. Um, and then like certain family members or like good friends that I trust explicitly, but like that's part of the issue is so much abuse happens with people that are close to the family. So you really like just, statistically that's it it's usually people you know children are rarely abused by someone that's a total stranger um and so I sit with it in that my children will not have sleepovers with friends or people we don't know well until they are older like when they're in middle school high school and they're able to tell me things they're able to stick up for themselves protect their bodies tell parents when things are going on I'm okay with that but now when they're five and two I'm not going to just drop them off at someone's house and let them have a sleepover with friends like we did. Yeah. And it was so fun. And I had the best times. Yeah. But after hearing all the horror stories that I've heard, yeah. I just can't do it. Okay. Okay. I can't do it. No, and, and I'm glad you clarified because at least for the purpose of this conversation and, and your stance on it, yeah, I, I tend to not really having had to thought about this much yet because my kids are two and four. Yeah. And we're in a pandemic, you know, right. um, but, but yeah, I, 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 I was thinking about it more in terms of them being older and going, really? Like, we're not going to have sleepovers with our girlfriends. And I had several birthday parties that were yeah. sleepovers, you and know, they were great. and they were great. I mean, yeah. and so I'm glad you clarified that. And I think that, I think most importantly, it's, you come from a place that you have experience with to make that decision, right? So you've heard the stories, you're in the realm, you're an educator, 
that's your position. Yeah. And I think like anything else, everyone can, at the end of the day, you're not a mom that says, if you do something this way, that's different for me, you're a bad parent. Right. No. Yeah. And I know, and I know that about you just from your videos, you're sharing your experience and you're sharing your take and your advice and, and all of that. But we're still all at the end of the day, each we're, there are kids and we do what we need to do. Right. Yep. <laughs> like, yeah. hundred percent. And I yeah. see that all the yeah, time. I know you do. Yeah. I'll say, and you wouldn't believe some of the comments I get, yeah. but I'll say, Hey, um, here's what I do. Take it or leave it. Right. Here's what research shows. Right. This is why, how, why I made this informed decision, mm-hmm. but you are the parent of your children. So you make the best decision for you and your mm-hmm. child. And people will go, you're shaming me. And I'm like, wait, what? Right. I'm it's not like, shaming you. You missed the whole point of <laughs> like, what I just said. Right. Like rewind. Explaining <laughs> yeah. my position on something for why I made a personal decision is not shaming you. Yeah. I did not say you're a bad parent because you choose to do sleepovers. Yeah. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. That's the tricky thing with these, with the, with social media and being so public. It's, it is you true. know, you can be, mm. I, uh, I was just gonna I was gonna choose my words very carefully yeah. because you know you can be a, a creator and you can put your stuff out there and you can have the people that it's meant for see it and resonate with it and learn from it and then you have the bots and the I'm gonna say that word instead uh-huh. of what I really want to say but yeah. you know you have the people that just want to argue anyway we don't yeah. have to go down that road it's because it's, it's just I, no, it's, get, leads to it. nowhere. Yeah, I get you. They just want to argue and they just want to um, be offended, right? And I'm like, okay, it's I'm, so I'm not it's so about that. them. Yeah, and they try to make it about you because it's yeah. so about them, and it's so it's it's so brutal to watch. Like I really try not to even look at comments on TikTok because, mm-hmm. and I don't even mean on my own stuff. I don't even get that many comments. I mean on other people's because they just piss me off. Like I just yeah. yeah. Anyway, and TikTok is vicious. It is. Comments or wise. Yeah, it's a totally different level than any, than Instagram mainly yeah. is my, compa- yeah, it's just, I don't know. I think yeah. because um, I, I, I've just always chalked it up to the fact that like the for you section, it's like people can comment on videos without having any other context of your right. other videos. Right. It's like they're literally seeing an opinion you have for 15 seconds <laughs> and making up an entire story about you. And a total yeah. judgment of yes. everything, yeah. So I just tell myself, you know, I'm not for everyone, and that's okay. I won't be. Right. No creator is for everybody. So you just, I know people can just pick and choose what what they respond to and what they like, and um, I'm not going to take things personally. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that sounds to me like a way that you take care of yourself and Mm -hmm. care for yourself and and this is something I talk about a lot is is self-care like yeah how you have so much on your plate single mom couple of jobs two kids do you find time to take care of care of yourself and if so how (laughs) I do um and it's tricky Mm -hmm. not gonna lie pandemic has not been helpful in that it's brutal um really brutal yeah so I just became a single mom what month is it February Jeez, time is flying by so I got divorced in June but we moved away from their father last April okay so it's been almost a year now that I've had the kids full time I have full physical custody no breaks mm-hmm. um luckily I moved back home my family lives down the street so if mm-hmm. I ever need anything they do watch the kids here and there for me so I can get a break um but my my break time is at night when they're in bed yeah. and I, I give up sleep to have more mental health time. Mm-hmm. And I know that's a very common thing with parents. I for, what is it called? Like revenge? Yes. Revenge yeah. bedtime procrastination. Yeah. You see how quick I came up with that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, it's called revenge something. And I have ADHD mm. too mm-hmm. on top of it. So I do it even more. So, yeah. but to me, my mental health, is more important to me than my sleep. And I know that sounds silly because it's like, well, you need sleep to like have good mental health. Well, yes and no. I can, I need caffeine. I have caffeine to function during the day. Need it. It also helps my ADHD because I'm not on meds right now. So I need that to help me get things done. Right. Okay. 
So at night, this is my time. Like this is my me time. And I fit in everything during this time. The first 30 minutes to an hour is my cleaning time Mm -hmm. because I don't want to take the time during the day because I'm so busy working Mm -hmm. that those little instances I get to interact with my two-year-old or then to make dinner and hang with my five-year-old, I need to take that to be with them and not be cleaning. So do I have dishes in the sink all day? You betcha. Is there laundry everywhere? Yup, because I don't get to it till at the end of the day (laughs) when they're in bed. That's my time. And I know it's kind of like, oh my gosh, you're doing that stuff on your alone time. Yeah, but I I have to have a timer to do it or I'm not going to do it because of ADHD. Mm. So I set a timer. I have 30 minutes to an hour and it actually helps me to like plan my day and just not to worry about all that stuff everywhere because I know I'm going to do it tonight. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to get to it. So I get that stuff done and then I just relax, grab a glass of wine, watch my shows, Mm -hmm. work. I mean like whatever I want to do. Mm-hmm. That's when I'll have a sitter come over so I can go out with my boyfriend, so I can go out with my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my me time. And mm-hmm. I do fit in exercising, but that's in the morning. If I don't do it in the morning, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, but I do it with my two-year-old because I can't get up before him because yeah. I'm not in bed till like midnight or 1 a.m. Yeah. I was just going to ask you what time you go to bed. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's like midnight, 1 a.m. So I have like four hours to myself every night. Yeah. 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 And you need it. I need it. And my kids will get me up at 630, Mm -hmm. like clockwork. They are early birdies, which is fine because I just literally roll out of bed and make coffee. And then I'm like, let's go. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's just how how I function. I mean, if it – whatever works for you, right? I mean, I don't know. I just had this – I had a doctor's appointment a couple of months ago, and I was – I basically went to the doctor to learn that – Everything I was like feeling, you know, just like the all the fatigue and 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 the um kind of like fogginess and and I am on antidepressants and all of that, yeah. but you know the inability to lose weight, like all of this. She finally we did all this blood work, <laughs> and she's like, "You're fine. You're just stressed." And she's like, "Tell me something you stress about." And I was like, "How long? Like how long can we sit here?" Right. You know. But the first thing that came to mind was was sleep. Yeah. And she, she said to me, she's like, you know what? Do we need sleep? Yes. She goes, but you are a mom of two small kids mm-hmm. and you need to take care of yourself. And stressing about how much sleep you get or don't is worse for you than if you just accept the level of sleep that you get. Like, just start telling yourself the amount of sleep you get is the amount of sleep you need. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And and she goes, she goes, the only suggestion I would make is if you can keep consistent bedtime and wake time. Yeah. Even if it's not seven to eight hours of sleep, she's like, just go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. And I was like, even that's hard, honestly. But right. last night, my son was up till 2.30. I think he's got a growth spurt or something. But it's like, you know, but that's her. That's exactly her point. She's like, right sleeping or stressing about sleep is worse than if you just just move on from it you know (laughs) totally and I function totally fine on six hours yeah if you feel great you feel great I feel fine like I'm good and like I said I I noticed that on the nights I go to bed early but I miss that mental health time I am a crabbier mom the next day yeah. Because I didn't get to have that me time to really decompress because I was unconscious. I was asleep. Yeah. yeah. I would rather <laughs> stay up late, have my time, eat my snacky snacks, watch my Netflix, have a glass of wine, talk with my girlfriends, whatever, get a little less sleep, drink coffee, and yeah. I'm a good mom the next day. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And, and I think that that will be like a sigh of relief for other yeah. moms with toddlers listening. Um, right. But, all right, so s- s- newly divorced, single mom, what have you learned in this time about being a single mom that you would have never known prior to this experience? Um, oh, there's a few things. I think I, what I mostly learned was just how isolated and, like, stuck at home I am. Mm. Because once the kids are in bed, I can't just run out to the store. Right. Oh, I just need to go get one thing, though. Nope. 
kids are in bed. Don't have a sitter. There's you're going to go call your family. Like, I, I don't and what are you going to do? Right get a now. sitter so you can go to CVS? Right. You know, like, yeah, I, I, right. I get that. So I've yeah. become diligent about planning my errands and things I need to do during the day because I know I do not have time. Mm-hmm. Yes, nighttime, their bedtime is my me time, but it is not my going out time because I am stuck here. It's not entirely free. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It's not yes. entirely free time. Right. I am still stuck at home, which is fine. But like, again, I work from home pandemic, like I'm kind of itching to get out. Yeah. Um, and I guess I just never thought about that before. I yes. never really, I mean, I didn't have a reason to think about right. being a single parent before. Um, right. even though I was raised in a single parent household as well. Um, but I was raised by my dad, not my mom. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I never realized that until now, because when I was married, I could be like, Hey, watch the kids. I'm running out. And right. that was my mental health break too, was to get out. And I don't have that. Yeah. So I yeah. think that's like the main thing I, I learned, but also, um, I guess the other big thing I learned was just how easy it is to get overwhelmed and overstimulated as a single parent, mm. because I am, I am like, so I'm working so hard every day to provide. And yes, their father does pay child support. Bless him. Thank God. Um, but, you know, I'm now trying to provide for my kids. I'm trying to set up a future for us. So I'm working, working for companies during the day while I'm watching my two-year-old at the same time. That's tough. And then there is nobody to come save me at the end of the work day. Yeah. I'm it. So yeah. it's, okay, take off the work hats, put back on mom hat, which really has just been on all day. But now my other son's home from school. So now I got two hats on. And now I need to do the homework we need to do playtime, make dinner, read the books, bath time, bedtime routine. It is so much easier for me now to lose it on them. Yeah. Yeah. Because before I had that support person, I had that person that I could say, we would, my ex and I would tell each other all the time, I need to get out for a second or I'm going to lose it. Like mm-hmm. you need to step in. And then the other one of us would take, you know, a minute out. The other one would come in. Mm-hmm. I don't have that anymore. And, um, it's been rough. Yeah. It's been rough. My, my fuse has been shorter for sure now yeah. as a single mom. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think, I think about that fairly often actually, because yeah. I have this, I definitely feel that that desire for the savior sometimes yeah. at the end of the day. And I'll start stalker calling my husband at like four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> like, Hey, just, it starts casual. Like when are you coming home? What's going on? Yeah. And then the later it gets, it's more like, where are you? You um, <laughs> said you'd be home in an hour and it's been 61 minutes, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, I, and I think about it a lot, actually more so when he's out of town or, on nights where he says to me, I'm not going to be home till 11. I've got to work this and that. And, and it's like this, this survival mode kicks in and it's almost like the expectation of the savior is gone. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually more able to power through. But what I want to say about it is that every time I'm in that zone, I think of single parents and go, but this is every day. Yeah that mode that kicks on for me it kicks on because the other days I have the support and I I just can recognize it right I can recognize the difference and I just always think my god this this is every day I mean I I commend you so much and and everything that you're doing because it's man to to have a partner in it with me and still be where I am I can't I can't imagine. I, I I don't know. I hate even saying I can't imagine because what you don't have a choice. You have to do it. Right. 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 But I mean, you know? and it's not to invalidate at all, you know, what you're doing. I mean, you're totally valid in oh, feeling know, overwhelmed and all. Thank you. Um, I know. Thank you. I know. I just, <laughs> it's, it's next level though. It is. It's, it's really hard. Yeah. Like it's yeah. really hard. And yeah. I have people ask me like, how do you do it? I'm like, I have to take breaks. Yeah. And like, I just posted a TikTok about this um, a couple days ago, last week or so where I've trained my kids that mommy has to go take a break now. I'm going to be in my bedroom. What do you need? Like, what can I set up for you so that you're independent? You want a movie on? Okay. I put the movie on. Yeah. Do you, what, what puzzles can I get out for you? And I've trained them. They play in, I mean, they're almost three and five and a half. So they do play together now. 
it took yeah. a while to get here. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't leave the two year old alone for a long time, right. but now they're to the point where they can't play alone and I step out and I, ha I have to take breaks. Yeah. I do have ADHD. I get even more overstimulated than, than others. I guess mm -hmm. the neurotypicals, um, just from the noise and all, and I have, to, I have to take breaks. Otherwise I, don't, I would not be able to do it. How, how old were you when you were either diagnosed professionally or self-diagnosed, whichever AD, with I ADHD? Was, yeah, I was diagnosed professionally at, I think it was 31. Wow. I was still in Alaska, and I just turned 33. I was either 32 or 31. Okay. Um, I was in Alaska, and I was in therapy. And it's funny, but I actually found out from TikTok. Yes, because, like heard, somebody else. Yes, I, I heard yeah. this before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I saw a TikTok and this lady was talking about how bedtime, getting ready for bed was so hard for her to do. And I thought, oh my gosh, I do that. That's that's so me. My whole life, my friends, when we would have sleepovers, would hate having sleepovers with me. Because it would take me like an hour to go brush my teeth and wash my face. And they're like, that takes like five minutes, Alyssa. Like, why? And I'm like, I don't know how to explain to you that it's just really hard for me to do. Like, I just cannot get up and go do it. And then when I'm there, I'm thinking about 50 million things and I can't do it, whatever. I just, so yeah. I had that discussion with my therapist and I'm like, yeah, like, what is that? Like, isn't that so funny? I don't have ADHD though. I'm not like hyperactive or anything. Like, obviously I'm fine, whatever. And she was, she didn't tell me, but she actually did a test on me. Hmm. then where it was a, a like a scale thing and like the front was she's like I just want you to take this I'm like okay so the front was attention deficit and then the back was hyperactive I scored off the charts hmm. uh, for attention deficit wow off the charts like wow. 10 out of 10 yeah. and then the back side <laughs> was hyperactive in talking ah. only interesting and so yeah so then I'm like wait what and so then I'm I'm reading about this. I'm finding podcasts. I'm talking to other people and I'm just crying because I feel like my whole life was so much harder than it needed to be. Mm. I had to work 10 times harder than my best friend to study for that test. Mm. Am I dumb? No, but I couldn't retain the information mm -hmm. and standard methods of studying did not work for me. Mm -hmm. And my mind is just always like ding, 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 ding. Mm -hmm. But I, we just thought I was ditzy. And I'm just kind of like that. But no, these are actually like real heart, clinical like, signs. I'm heartbroken for your younger self. Right. Me too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she just thought I would get called blondie all the time because people oh, thought I was God. just like so ditzy mm -hmm. and like in the clouds. I was daydreaming, mm -hmm. but I was a smart girl right. and I was also that perfectionist. So teachers didn't, you know, didn't say anything. I wasn't like climbing out of my chairs, but I was chatty. But yeah. all girls are chatty, right? That's a yeah. personality trait of females, right? Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. I had um, a friend of mine, Diana, on the show, and she she had a very similar experience. Just her whole childhood, you know, and it, hers, she did talk about, like, getting, you know, less than stellar grades and really, really struggling and then finally getting a diagnosis was like just feeling seen for the first time in her yeah. life as like a high school or college kid I can't remember um but yeah just and 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 I know her very well I've worked with her and it's the same as you she's incredibly intelligent mm. but just different just learns yeah. and works differently yeah yeah I could do a it's whole wild. thing on oh, that I talk about it for a long time. So what do you, so how do you, how do you manage it a little bit now that you know? So thank God I know. And right. I found out before I got divorced because it was hard for me. Some of the struggles I had in my marriage, we didn't know was due to my ADHD. Interesting. I was drowning in housework, which I'd say any mother does. That's yeah. Yeah. right. Right. But I was more part I was more drowning than a <laughs> than an average bear. Right. <laughs> so like the dishes would literally sit there for like days. <laughs> and my ex would be like, Yo, like mold is growing. Like this is not okay. And I'd be like, I don't know how to tell you that like I cannot physically get my body over there to do that right now. And yeah. now we know like executive dysfunction, right? Like that's all this ADHD things. 
So now that I know that I have all these issues, um, I don't know if I want to even call it issues, challenges. Mm -hmm. I have all of these little tricks that I've learned. I follow great people, right, on Instagram, TikTok, podcasts. Yeah, I listen a lot to out there now. Women. Oh, so helpful. Yeah. So I have all these tricks I do. So I listen to me. I have to listen to music to do dishes. Have to. Okay. If I don't have music playing on my Alexa, it's not getting done. Okay. Can't do it. Unloading, unloading dishwasher. Nope. So I play music because my brain needs to be doing something else so that I'm not drowning in the madness of how boring dishes are. <laughs> right? Because then I'm not going to be able to do it. So. Drowning in the <laughs> madness of how boring <laughs> dishes are. <laughs> that's literally how I feel about it. Like, that's how I'm, like, I'm laughing because I, I really, it's so, I can't yeah. take it. I can't either. It's awful. Yeah. I know. ADHD moment. You know what's so funny about this is I'd say like 90% of my best girlfriends also have ADHD because mm. I click with other neurodivergent people. Fascinating. Well. It, that is so, amazing. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so tricks of how I survive this is music. Mm -hmm. um, I have to. And that also goes for when I'm cleaning any other room. So if I'm in the bathroom cleaning toilets, music's on. Mm -hmm. Vacuuming, I can't hear it. It's fine. Um, but I usually have music playing. And the time thing, I have to have a time that I'm going to do it or it's not happening. So I set 30 minutes to an hour every day. That's my time to do these things. That's when it's happening. Um, laundry, I have to be watching a show <laughs> on the couch, right? I, right. It has to be, I have to have something else going on. Yeah. I cannot just sit here and do these. Yeah. And the difference, scores. and the difference is not that it's not as simple as well, why don't I just watch a show while I'm doing laundry? Because it's more enjoyable. It's like, this is how it gets done. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's Because it's yeah. different. I know a lot of people yeah. who watch shows and do laundry because it's convenient. I'm okay. one of them. But yeah. I can also do it without. <laughs> I cannot do it without. Yeah, exactly. It's a difference. The laundry yeah. will sit there for a month. Yeah. And I will not touch it. But if I no. bring the basket over to the couch and I put TV on, I can get it done quickly. Yeah. Um, another hack is I don't fold laundry. You just put it in. Yep. Put it in the drawer. Just yep. Whatever. I made TikToks on this and it blew people's minds. I the bet. Per the perfectionists were like ready to kill me. Um, <laughs> they're like, wait, what? I'm going to come over right now. And <laughs> Do you know what I just pictured? <laughs> was like a Marie Kondo style <laughs> set of drawers next to yours. <laughs> okay. So when that came out, when did yeah. that come out? Like, Couple, couple years, years ago, ago, yeah. When that came out, my couple of friends that are perfectionists, <laughs> my couple of friends that are perfectionists, they were like, "Oh my god, Alyssa, you need this. Like, you need to, you need to watch this. You know, read it. Whatever. This is the best thing." And I'm like, "What is it?" They're like, "Oh, it's an organizational thing." I'm like, "Oh god, okay." So I start looking at it, and I'm like, "Um, this is stressing me out." Like. Yeah. I'm a 10 out of 10 right now. And yeah. they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is supposed to relax you and show you how to like organize these things. I'm like, you don't understand. Organ organizing is stressful for me. Yeah. Like I can't do it. And it's not like I'm a pig, right? Like I, I, no, I can, my, I can see, I can I see have, your room. It's perfectly fine. Thank you. I have my things where they're supposed to be, but don't tell me to over organize and throw things. I can't do that. That's yeah. too much management. Yeah. So the clothes, I the trick is just to not overstuff the drawers. Okay. Okay? My kids stuff too. So like my boys, one drawer is just pants. Mm -hmm. And I just flop them on top of each other. Yeah. Sure. It's not a free for all. It's just No. It's just different. It's, it's just different. Yeah. You know what we'll call it? I'll call it it's halfway folding. Okay. So I don't fold it all the way. Right. But I'm not throwing it in there. Yeah, I you're not like, like it's not crumbled up in a ball. It's just no. And I yeah. hang up. I hang up the nice stuff. Okay. See, hangers. Hangers are amazing. If I hang it, I can do that while watching TV. Just boom, boom, boom. Hanger, go put it up. <laughs> That's how I do it. <laughs> so these are some of my ADHD tips and tricks. I love it. I love it. Therapy. I mean, it just speaks to, like. Who made the rule that you have to fold clothes? Like, Thank you. Where did this come from? Oh, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. It's never worked for me. Yeah. I don't do it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love I'm it. Happier. I'm happier yeah. that way. 
So. I love it. All right. So ADHD figured it out in therapy. What brought you to therapy? Um, <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Yes. Okay. Woo. All right. I don't know where to start. I'll keep it brief. Mm -hmm. Um, so my parents divorced when I was five, uh, years old. My mom, um, left the family for a drug and alcohol addiction, pretty severe. Um, so when they divorced, my brother and I actually lived with my mom first for like the first six months of the divorce. And that's when she spiraled, Mm -hmm. um, saw a lot of things I should never have seen. Mm -hmm. That's where all my childhood trauma, most of it comes from that six month period. Wow. And it was, that's a very formative age. Yeah. I was in first grade. So. Yeah. Wow. Um, so it was pretty tough. So then yeah. she lost custody of us. We went and lived with my dad. My dad raised us. So I was raised by a single parent. He was an entrepreneur, has his own business. So he was busy working and, um, we, you know, he did the best he could and did an amazing job. Like best dad ever. I had a great childhood still, but mm-hmm. I had a lot of mommy problems. Mm-hmm. Didn't see my mom. She was in and out of jail, prison rehab, halfway houses, my whole life, barely saw her. And, um, that's part of, I think what makes me who I am now as a mom is I knew I always wanted to be the mom I never had. And so that's why I pushed so hard to be a really good mom for them. Sorry, I'm trying not to cry. Um, so anyway, I have a lot, I had a lot of trauma and issues from that. Mm -hmm. But then I went to college, you know, got through that, went right into teaching went through that, had my first baby and I was crushed by postpartum depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. I I have high functioning anxiety, which I know now is usually also coupled with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just was hit so hard with high depression, high anxiety after his delivery, which was very traumatic, um, and caused a lot of pain and damage. And, you know, I was down and out for months for after wow. his delivery. It was a forcep delivery. Oh, wow. Did a wow. lot of damage on me. I was in physical therapy, <clears throat> wow. physical therapy, um, which is another passion of mine is educating mothers on get pub- public floor physical therapy. Like I know a lot of women in America don't even know it's a thing, but oh, it's no. common in Europe. You got to do it anyway. So I was just drowning in motherhood. So by like three, four months postpartum, I was so miserable. I was ready to just end my life. Mm. And I was like, I need to get help. Like, this is not okay. Like I'm, this is not who I am. I've gone through bouts of depression before, like in high school, you know, like puberty, but nothing like this. And I knew it was because I wasn't sleeping because I had a newborn Mm -hmm. and my ex had to go work. He was in the military Mm -hmm. and I wasn't sleeping. My, my kid was up every hour exclusively breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. I was exhausted. Um, so I, we were military. So I went to the military hospital and I told them, I think I have like postpartum depression and anxiety. And at first they kind of blew me off. They're like, oh, is it the baby blues? And I was like, no, I'm on like month three. Um, <laughs> isn't the first two weeks <laughs> post yeah. baby? That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. yeah. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, um, like, no, I have, like, I, I need help. And then mm-hmm. they gave me the checklist. Do you show these symptoms? I'm like, yeah. yes. Yeah. Times a million. So then I started therapy then. And I did therapy um, when we were there in Virginia. That's where we had my first son. We were stationed there. Um, And then we moved to Alaska to his next duty station. And I started up again there when I was pregnant with my second son to try to counteract it from happening again. Mm. Did it work? It did. But I think a lot of things went into that. His delivery was a breeze. Okay. I didn't feel so scared anymore because I I felt confident as a mother and a woman. I know what I'm doing this time and I got this. I can do this. Mm -hmm. Um, Having his brother there that I needed to be strong for and still play with every day, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. So I did therapy then in Alaska for three years. Mm -hmm. I stayed way longer than I thought, but I just kept thinking, gosh, you know, I have so many things to work through all this childhood stuff. And then it became marital stuff and then it became divorce stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a big believer in therapy and I would totally be in it right now if I could uh, afford it. But yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a, it's a problem. It's a big problem. <laughs> Military healthcare. I mm-hmm. lost. It. Yeah. Someday. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all that. I know yeah. you just briefly explained what seems to be a lot of impactful moments in your life. And the one that I will ask you about further is, can you share what postpartum depression and anxiety 
looked like for you? How did it manifest and how did you start to know? Um, and I ask to give you some guidance on that because I feel like that even that's a loaded question mm -hmm. to give you guidance on that. I didn't recognize my own postpartum depression until I heard another woman talk about hers oh. and say the thing she said. And I was like, oh, I do that. Oh, I do that. Oh, I feel that. Oh, I get that. Like kind of like your ADHD moment. Yeah. And so, so I, I, I'll ask you because that's, that's why I'm doing this. If yeah. someone's listening and maybe their postpartum experience doesn't sound like mine, but it might yeah. sound like yours, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm all about it. Um, I started to notice that I felt very trapped in the house. Mm. And I know that that is, an, I think, a normal thing with new mothers, right? Because you kind of are, because you have a newborn. And at this time, it wasn't a pandemic back in 2016 when this was going on. Right. I could have gone out and gone anywhere, done mm -hmm. anything For with any walk. friends, and I didn't. Yeah. I just kind of felt like I was stuck in this house and I'm trapped here and I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. And my friends worked, they were all teachers, but like, I didn't want to go out with them. I didn't want to see them. And that's so not like me. And then I would, I was crying a lot all the time. And I remember one of the things that I later told my therapist when I was in therapy, but I remember one of the things that I thought all the time was, gosh, this was supposed to be easy. Why isn't this so easy? I was supposed to be this great mom. I was supposed to do this. Why aren't I doing it? Why can't I just do this and have it just be so easy and great? And when I said that to my therapist months later, she was like, that's your depression talking. You are doing it. Look at you. Yeah. You got the baby up this morning. You changed him. You fed him. He's smiling. He's dressed. That's the job. Yeah. yeah. She's like, you got him in the car seat, in the car, in the stroller, and in here. You're doing it right now. Why are you telling yourself you're not doing it? Right. And I was like, I don't know. I guess I just thought I would be like, I don't know. I don't know. I guess happy. I am doing it. <laughs> yeah. I guess I thought I'd be happy doing it. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that mindset and just realizing that, like, my mind is playing these tricks on me. Like, mm -hmm. I am doing this right now. Um, anxiety part, I kept thinking that. Um, something bad was going to happen to the baby mm -hmm. more than normal, like more than a normal amount. Like, Oh, he's going to get sick. I can't take him here. He's going to get sick. Or uh, I can't he, like when he's sleeping, he would be sleeping. And I'm like, I have to stay here until, you know, like this time to make sure that he's for sure not going to suffocate on his sheets. I mean, it was just like too much heightened, yeah, heightened anxiety. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just, I knew, I knew I'm like, I'm not sleeping on top of this. I'm up every hour to nurse the baby and he wouldn't take a pacifier or a bottle because he had a tongue and lip tie that the hospital would not cut. So I was it. I was it. That was yeah. all. I'm the only person that could sue them. And it was just, it was killing me. And I remember I had a moment when I was rocking my son in, in his rocking chair in his room. I don't, I've never told anybody this before. So here I am telling everybody, um, <laughs> surprise. I had a moment where I was like, you know, I think he would be better off without me. I don't think I should be here anymore. I think he would be better in the world without me because I'm such a bad mom and I'm so terrible. And I just started crying and trying to think of all the ways that I could end my life. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And then I was like, like something kind of like shook me and I was like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like you love life and you're such a happy, positive person and your baby needs you. Like, what are you talking about? And I was like, okay, I need to get help. Like, this is not okay. Like, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. And I was like, and I'm, and I know he needs me. I'm his mom. Like yeah. what? Um, and so like next day I told, I mean, at the time you can make appointments and just go in. I told my now ex-husband, I was like, I, I need to get help. Like, I'm not thinking right. Like something's wrong with me and I'm not being myself. He's like, I know, but I don't know how to help you. Yeah. I'm like, well, I know that. Like, yeah this is my first time doing this too. Like I didn't yeah. expect this to happen. Um, so I got help, but it's a lot, it was a lot of things. Yes. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing it. Yeah. It's emotional to hear. And I think mostly because obviously I'm looking at you. I can, I have, I can see the emotion on your face and hear <laughs> it in your voice, mm -hmm. but also because I think, 
I think so many of us have been there or have been close to there. And it's such a shameful thing to go through until you go through it and you process it and you learn from it and you get the help. Yeah. And it feels terrifying. Yeah. And so a same as I said before, it's like, I'm picturing you in that chair and I'm so glad you got help. And, and I also can recognize, although there is still emotion, obviously feelings are okay. Yeah. That I'm sure there was a time where you couldn't have even said that out loud. And there's, there's women listening that are in that place too, that are going, wow, I hear all of that. I feel all of that. And now I have the job of telling someone and that is another hurdle. Yeah. It's really, it's intense. The whole thing is intense. Yeah. And, and I was embarrassed. Yes. I remember thinking, I'm supposed to love this. Yeah. Well, and here you are also trying to rewrite the story, right? Like saying earlier, I want to be the mom I didn't have. Yep. And here you are, your brain is this just, like you said, playing tricks. And I was just picturing, I, I literally, as soon as you said playing tricks, I just pictured like this green monster with its like claws in your brain. Oh, I don't know yeah. why. I just, that was like the image I got and probably because that's how I've sometimes pictured my brain, you totally. know? And it's like, gosh, yeah. Yeah. And- You're just trying to do your best. Yeah. And- and it also, in a weird way, made me understand my mom more. Yeah, I can imagine. Because she she also had postpartum depression. And yeah. She obviously, you know, she has mental illnesses. And so yes. I kind of understood more about like, wow, when you're sick, you're sick. Yeah. Um, and so I, and I found a lot of healing in motherhood with my mother. I bet, yeah. And that helped me there too. And then, you know, but I got better. Yeah. And she did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I I think, and I was, yeah, I think the interesting thing about motherhood and about what you're saying to me is that idea that I, I know a lot of people use this now, but the, the, or talk about this now, but the first person I heard it from was Dr. Becky Kennedy talking about, you know, how, how two things can be true. Mm -hmm. On one hand, you can be sitting there your brain is telling you your your son is better off in this world without you. And on the other hand, you fully recognize how much you love him and would do anything for him. Right. And it's totally wild. Totally. And on lesser scales, they drive us absolutely insane and we need five minutes away from them. But mm, we never want to be away from them. Like, right. it's like, how is this real like how how are we supposed to function like this I know it's literally the hardest thing on the planet and I I really want anyone listening if they're feeling like they're identifying with us and with me I want them to know that there is no there really is no shame in needing to get help yeah like there really isn't yeah ask go yeah do it um, I think the world is such a safer place now mm-hmm. for mental health and the discussions and getting help when it wasn't even five years ago when yeah. I went to get help and I was embarrassed to even tell my family I was going. Yeah. And I really didn't tell most of them they, they didn't live by me. So they didn't know right. how bad it was. And um, I think the world is a much safer space and place for getting mental health help. And even if it wasn't, you should go. Yeah. You got to go. Yeah. And you are proof of overcoming so much to be, I mean, we talked all about how overwhelming and overstimulating your life is, but yeah. I think you would say that generally you're happy. Yeah. Um, like, I, I mean, annoy people with how happy I am. Right. Like, and I, and I say, I didn't, I didn't mean to overly assume I'm a no. consumer of your content. So yeah. I've seen the videos where you talk about, you know, just your divorce is an example. We're much better as co-parents than as a married couple. And you're making your own way and you have your business and your boys are telling you about secret pajama days and <laughs> things are happening. You know, it's really, it's, it's wonderful to see. And so, yeah, 
It, yeah. um, I've overcome a lot, mm -hmm. but I guess I, that's another point I want to make to everybody is that you can too. Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of odds against me Yeah. growing up mm -hmm. and I didn't even have a female role model in my life or a mother. Yeah. And I, I don't want to, I'm not like the best mom and I have many faults. I'm very imperfect, but I'm like, I'm a good mom. Yeah. And I didn't even have a role model to help me do that. So you can do it too. Yeah. Um, you can overcome anything. And I've just always been a happy, optimistic person. <laughs> um, it annoys people. <laughs> My ex-husband would tell me all the time, um, cause he's a little bit more of like a pessimist realist. And he would always say, you know, Alyssa, the world it can't always be butterflies and rainbows. Mm -hmm. And I would say, why not? Yeah. Like, but, but also, you? but also you're very aware of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. because that's the first thing I thought, like we just did an hour about how aware of that you are, <laughs> you know, your childhood, motherhood, yeah. postpartum. Like mm -hmm. it's not that you live in a fairy tale land. No. You yeah. just, you have an outlook. You got to look at the positive side. I'm only here one time. Yeah. So um, I know how precious life is and I want to enjoy every minute and I want to meet as many wonderful people as I can, like yourself. <laughs> and I want to learn from them and I want to have a positive impact on them. And I don't know, man, I just love life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I love it. And I, I, uh, I'll be, I've already overstayed my welcome with our time here. So oh, I, I appreciate it. And I, I feel yeah. like that's a great, a great place to end. So Alyssa, thank you so much for your time. Oh. I, I know I could go on for another couple of hours. <laughs> I know. We'll have to do it again sometime. I had so much fun chatting with you. It was really great. I'm happy to meet you. came away feeling so connected to Alyssa after this interview, which I guess is what happens when you get deep immediately, right? But I've also followed and consumed Alyssa's content for some time now and can tell you that her authentic self comes through in those videos. She is what she appears to be, which, you know, I think just solidified the connection because we, I had a base connection that was not returned because she didn't know who I was. But in truly connecting with her and speaking with her, it's so obvious that she is exactly as she says she is on social media. And, and it just, I don't know. It's nice. Anyway. All right. Moving on. I absolutely love conversations where we can laugh and dig deep into some intense stuff. I think that's often the beauty of the conversations that I have on this show is hearing and feeling the duality of motherhood and our experience as adult women. My big takeaways are number one, that working with our kids on consent and body autonomy, our, the whole conversation around tickling and, um, and all of that is, is that it's a practice. I, I was truly so thankful to get to walk through this with Alyssa because I was concerned that I was really messing up by not asking permission every single time I wanted to hug my kids. But it did also feel like that's impossible. So Anyway, I, I really appreciated her clarifying that, and I also loved her explanation on secrets versus surprises. So spot on. Just such good stuff to think about and take with us as we, uh, we, I was going to say as, you know, I raise my kids. We raise my kids, but, you know, you raise your own, I'll raise mine. <laughs> anyway, uh, Alyssa also shared her experience with ADHD, which we all now know how not alone she is, and I just... You heard me laughing the whole time she's talking about how she just doesn't fold clothes, right? Like, who made this rule? I mean, I get it. To, like, I get, you know, the, the organization and, and whatnot. But it just, it's like, ah, what always was doesn't have to be, right? If it doesn't work for you. So, and I just appreciate her sharing so much about the routines that she's set up for herself so that she is successful. And, um, yeah. I don't know. That whole conversation really made me think. It's like, who cares if your stuff's not folded? And, you know, you just got to do you. Do what works for you. And, of course, you know, last but certainly not least, Alyssa, your bravery in sharing your childhood experiences. And um, I don't know about you listening, but my emotions were running high as Alyssa talked about being the mom to her kids that she always wanted to, for herself. I think that there's aspects of that sentiment that 
we can all relate to. And I just really appreciate her her really going there because it's it's not easy to talk about. And I will just reiterate what Alyssa said at the end there about getting help. Because I believe in it so much that if you or someone you know or love is struggling with depression, postpartum depression, anxiety, OCD, suicidal thoughts, intrusive thoughts, please get help. Please get professional help. And in the meantime, you can reach out to people like me and Alyssa, and we can share our experiences. We can cheer you on. And while, like I said, you know, we cannot replace professional help. We're not doctors. We're not counselors. We can support you and be there for you in a way that that works for you. I don't know. I don't know. I just want to help you. So, all right, that's it. Thank you so much, Alyssa, and thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. SAS Says is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sassays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later.